Thank you, Dr. Gillis. And uh, switching gears, I'd like to invite Dr. Edward Ree. He's a pediatric electrophysiologist practicing the Children's Heart Center um, in Phoenix, Arizona. He's going to talk to us about atrial flutter and congenital heart disease. Well, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, it's a sign of the times that we have a pediatrician speaking at an adult meeting. Um, so we'll call this the, the perfect storm, arrhythmia management in adults with congenital heart disease. And as you can see, these patients really create an almost ideal electrical substrate for uh, all the rhythms that they do have. And you can see a picture of our wonderful new uh, building that just went up the, uh, about two years ago. So I don't have any um, really good financial relationships, although sometimes I wish I did. And um, I'm not going to talk about anything magical that we don't have already, so this stuff can all be actually done. So my um, objectives are to characterize the scope and magnitude of the impending epidemic of adults with congenital heart disease. You know, we see the tip of the iceberg. There's a big stuff underwater, and, um, you know, it's the result of the wonderful successes in surgery that were done in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. So there's a whole cohort of people moving through. I want to describe the anatomic and physiologic substrates um, and ablation approaches. So uh, for the most common uh, arrhythmia that these adults have, and that's intraatrial or macro reentrant tachycardias. And then finally, I just want to touch a little bit on risk stratification for ventricular arrhythmias and um, sort of how we decide who to study, who not to study. And I have to do this in 20 minutes. So this is um, a document that's put out by the uh, Heart Association in 2008. This, I think, was 128 pages. This was the largest document that they ever put out on sort of the care and feeding of adults with congenital heart disease. This is bigger than the acute MI document. So I thought that was uh, a good start. And if you look at the, the beginning of this document, scope of the problem. So patients with adult congenital heart disease are actually a problem. So since the advent of neonatal repair in the 70s, 85% of patients will survive into adult life. Uh, there are more than a million adults with congenital heart disease living in the United States. And in fact, there are more adults with congenital heart disease than there are children. And uh, given uh, our expected survival and less than 5% mortality, you know, it's expected that up to one in 150 adults will have some kind of heart disease. Now, this may be a minor little thing that doesn't need any intervention, but um, there's the whole spectrum. And then they do, the document goes on to make uh, specific recommendations. Uh, basically, it says that anybody that takes care of adults, emergency departments, adult cardiologists, internists, should know where the nearest adult congenital heart center is, have the phone number on your Rolodex. And uh, I see my colleague, Dr. Paviana, sitting out there in the audience, who is a, a pediatric electrophysiologist. I think you should all have his cell phone number in your speed dial. So trends in hospitalization. This is um, a paper that just looked at uh, presentations. And uh, this was called from a database that represents about 20% of um, the US population, a large multi-center database. So the number of um, hospitalizations for adult congenital heart disease increased 102% from 1998 uh, to 2005. So it's going up, it's going up exponentially. The number of simple, the number of complex diagnoses were pretty much represented by the uh, demographics of the population. Interestingly, the most um, common venue of presentation was the emergency department. 42% of people showed up in the ER. At least half of them would be at night then. Um, and the average patient age was in their 50s. Uh, these were not you know, the 19-year-old that just had their last uh, cardiology follow-up last year, but people that have been enjoying their uh, arrhythmic and heart failure honeymoon since uh, graduation from the parent's nest to their uh, reawakening. So arrhythmia ablation. Um, we all heard earlier in this uh, conference that antiarrhythmic drugs, they really don't work very well. They're not really medications. I always tell uh, patients and, and the residents that antiarrhythmic therapy is, it's electrical chemotherapy. These are poisons with occasionally beneficial side effects. So if we can cure something with ablation, either surgical or transcatheter, that's usually the way to go. So who do we select? How do we approach this? Um, it really depends on what your um, risk to benefit and expected outcomes are. So typical isthmus-dependent flutter, we've been ablating this for decades, very good results. Now, there are other people that do have isthmus-dependent flutter, these mustard and setting folks that we'll see later. However, their isthmus may sort of be on the other side of a piece of Dacron. Um, and then you sort of get into this point of diminishing returns. Uh, even organized macro flutter in people with a very abnormal tissue substrate, such as the Fontan patients, uh, the results are not as good. And atrial fibrillation, I kind of go back and forth on that one. We have better tools now, so that may uh, actually be uh, something that we can address. So this is from uh, 2003, uh, the consensus recommendations for atrial flutter. It hasn't been updated in 10 years, probably because it doesn't have to be. Uh, you can see that catheter ablation is quite effective. 
in people with conventional tissue substrates that are accessible to uh, the catheter. But uh, the red arrow here says these uh, patients uh, should be carefully selected and that drug therapy in people with structurally abnormal hearts should be used with caution. Not only the proarrhythmia with the 1C agents in people with coronary disease, but people with cardiomyopathy, as we saw earlier uh, in our conference, even our class three agents either have no improvement on all-cause mortality or can actually be harmful. So again, driving the, the need for a, a, a catheter, a mechanical-based approach. So this is uh, what you're gonna see mostly, what we call the unguarded isthmus. This is typical isthmus-dependent flutter going around the tricuspid valve. There may be a little higher incidence of uh, scar-related uh, lateral right atrial uh, figure of eight type circuits, but for the most part, um, these patients have a four-chambered heart in levocardia, their atrium is accessible to your catheter, and this can be ablated uh, with a conventional approach even without advanced three-dimensional mapping. You make the diagnosis of typical flutter based upon the typical sawtooth uh, uh, morphology of the flutter waves. You can do it with a multipole uh, halo-type catheter, and you just draw the isthmus line. So this is the kind of thing you're going to see most of the time in people with simple septal defects, the atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, complete canal. Ablation of other things such uh, anatomically based, such as AV node reentry, can be a little bit difficult in these patients. But with flutter, you can do the mapping. Uh, and again, likewise, in the more complex lesions, tetralogy of flow, they still have a normal right atrium for the most part, with the exception of the lateral wall incision. So this is the no-brainer. This is something straightforward. The catheter can get up there, and you just draw your isthmus line. So what we call the guarded isthmus. Um, so we just want to take uh, the paradigm of transposition of the great arteries uh, for this uh, bunch. So with transposition of the great arteries, you can see that the aorta is transposed where it rises from the uh, right ventricle. The pulmonary artery, pulmonary artery arises from the left ventricle. So the uh, blue blood just goes around the body and gets bluer and bluer, and the red blood comes back and goes to the lungs and gets redder and redder. And if obviously there's no mixing, you, you don't live very long. So in the 1950s, uh, people born with this lesion, it was universally fatal. There was really nothing you could do. The ductus closed, the frame closed, and you died. And then uh, between 1950 and 1959 came the Blalock-Hanlon septectomy, and this took a lot of courage. So what they would do is before bypass, they would lift the apex of the heart up, go behind the heart with a side-biting clamp, clamp the intraatrial septum, excise the piece, release the clamp, and it would just go bloop and fall back into the heart and create an atrial septal defect. So that allowed some of the red blood to come to the blue side, some of the blue blood come to the red side, and whatever you crossed is what you lived on. Then um, following that, um, the major surgical developments by Ake Senning and William Thornton Mustard in the uh, late 50s and early 60s were the functional correction. Uh, they actually tried this arterial switch thing where they reversed the, uh, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Everybody died because they could not move the coronary arteries. So once uh, Thorn uh, Mustard and Senning realized that microsurgery and transfer of the coronaries was not possible in that age, they said, let's do the next best thing. If I can't switch the great vessels, maybe I can sort of switch the atria. So both the uh, mustard and setting are variations on the atrial switch procedure where the caval veins are baffled over to the mitral valve, sometimes using a Dacron patch in the case of the mustard or using autologous tissue in the setting. That takes the blue blood to your left ventricle, takes it out to your lungs. Whatever space is left over in the atrium is the other side of the baffle. So the pulmonary venous return crosses the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, and gets ejected out the aorta. So pretty ingenious operation. Now you have a separated two ventricle circulation. Unfortunately, you have a RV as your systemic ventricle, a tricuspid valve as your systemic AV valve, and the left ventricle gets a little bit of a free ride. And you've got all these suture lines up here. And uh, for those of us that are into history, as we heard with Dr. Waldo's talk last night, this set of baffle lines is identical to the animal canine model that uh, Brian Hoffman came up with in Columbia in the uh, 70s for creating spontaneous atrial flutter in animals. This is the perfect lesion set to create atrial flutter. And by the way, it often transects the sinus node artery. So atrial flutter and sinus node dysfunction are very common in this group. And then um, afterwards, uh, they came with the arterial switch procedure, and it uh, was adopted into uh, wide use in the, uh, in the early 80s. So we have this cohort of 30 to 50-year-old patients that are moving through life with this exact circulation, and you'll see them. So here's our hypothetical case report. We have a 35-year-old uh, young uh, person with cyanosis at birth. He underwent a balloon septostomy, not the, uh, the open type, uh, at uh, day of life one. He had an atrial switch procedure at four months of age. He's had palpitations for a long time. He came into the emergency room and was diagnosed with flutter. Uh, he was started on antiarrhythmic medications. Uh, he comes back with multiple episodes of flutter, tachycardia-induced heart failure, RV failure. He has a bi-V ICD system, 
for primary prevention of sudden death, and he is sent to you to be fixed. So this is what his radiograph looks like. Um, he's got sort of an interesting system here. You see he's got a little bit of heart failure. He's got a transvenous lead down here in the ventricle, and that's actually in the left ventricle because that is the uh, blue ventricle. He's got an ICD. He's got an atrial lead that's, um, it should be right about here in the dome of the uh, left atrial, the dome of the anatomic left atrium, but it's sort of heading out to the appendage. Appendage is a nice place to put the atrial lead. Um, unfortunately, you get a lot of phrenic there. And he's got two epicardial um, bipolar lead right there on the RV, which is actually plugged into the LV port of the device. So that's his resync lead. And the RV, of course, is the systemic uh, ventricle, so you can't do it endocardially. And there are not great coronary sinus branches on the RV, so the surgical uh, approach is required. So here's his uh, EKG. Shows typical sawtooth negative waves. Uh, looks like flutter. So you're like, okay, this will be easy. Take my lab, blade it. Oops. So first thing, define the anatomy. So here is an angiogram. Hopefully this will play. There we go. So superior and inferior baffles, left atrium, left ventricle lungs. Now watch the levophase. Right down here, you'll see the little tricuspid valve. There, right there. Okay. So, there's the venous phase. Now watch on leave a phase as it comes around. You can see the isthmus right over here. Problem is, the isthmus is on the other side of a Dacron baffle. That's how you're going to get there. And that is where the flutter is. Okay, so um, this is the typical catheter setup we use for uh, mustard sending flutter. We have uh, one decapolar catheter that is up the superior baffle limb, sits up there just for atrial rate pacing and recording. The second one here looks very much like your CS uh, catheter. It slides along the uh, left atrium um, and will end up at the tip of the left atrial appendage. You can see here we have the typical flutter going with the negative flutter waves, and the activation on our decapolar catheters is all outward. So it's almost like the source is here somewhere, and there's just passive uh, conduction away. You can see that I do have a catheter near the isthmus, which is kind of a convoluted course. So what you see here is the catheter going retrograde. It's coming up the aorta, around the arch, across the aortic valve, through the right ventricle. Getting across the tricuspid valve can be a bit of a pain, and then it is laying down on the arterial or pulmonary venous side of the baffle, right on the isthmus. So uh, it's very difficult to get that catheter to do anything unless you have stereotaxis or really gifted fingers. Uh, so it's almost impossible to create an entire uh, activation map of the flutter circuit. So oftentimes what you want to do is just show me that the uh, isthmus is the target. Show me that the isthmus is in circuit. So this is an example of entrainment mapping on or near the isthmus. Um, so here, uh, did I miss one? Yeah, here we go. This is the one that's off the isthmus. So we're pacing. And uh, for those EP geeks out in the audience, we can see the first return cycle is long. So when you do entrainment pacing and you release, if the first return beat is long, that tells you that you're not part of the circuit. You're far away. And there's some time for the impulse to come in and out of the circuit. Therefore, the post-pacing interval is longer than the tachycardia cycle length. The other thing you'll see is that this entrainment is manifest. It's not concealed entrainment. So when we talk about entrainment with ventricular rhythmia is you want a 12 out of 12 QRS match. Well, it's difficult to do with P waves and flutter waves. But if you look at the intracardiac electrograms, that's our QRS surrogate. You can see that the intracardiac electrograms of the paced beats is different than the intracardiac electrograms of the spontaneous beat. So this is manifest entrainment. Post-pacing interval is long, and the entrained pacing pattern does not match the clinical arrhythmia. So I, wherever this catheter is, it's not part of the circuit. Here's an example um, where I'm on the isthmus and I am part of the circuit. Uh, you can see that uh, the post-pacing interval uh, when we release is identical to the tachycardia cycle length, and the intracardiac electrograms are either identical or very similar to the, uh, to the spontaneous rhythm. So this would be an example of in-circuit uh, entrainment. And if you can just tell that the isthmus is your target, then you don't have to map the whole thing. So fortunately, in this case, we were able to get the catheter to uh, swing around the uh, tricuspid valve, and uh, it's typical counterclockwise atrial flutter. This is with uh, the cardio system. Similar things can be obtained with the uh, ESI system. It shows just typical uh, counterclockwise isthmus-dependent flutter going around the tricuspid valve. And with ablation, you get the expected result.
So uh, the usual way we get there, I would say um, more than 90% of the time, we're able to do this with the retrograde approach. It helps a lot to have a bidirectional catheter. So you curl the catheter up to cross the aortic valve. You don't want the catheter going down the coronary arteries. You get into the body of the right ventricle, you extend the catheter, and uh, with some manipulation, you can get it to flop across the uh, tricuspid valve. Once you're across the tricuspid valve, you are in the region of the isthmus, you can do your entrainment, you can show that the isthmus is your target, you can begin to construct your ablation line. This is the pulmonary venous chamber, and you are ablating diagonal to the isthmus. So the line is gonna be long. So oftentimes this uh, tip of the ablation catheter will end up somewhere in the right pulmonary veins. You don't wanna energize it there, but that's how far out you go, and then you start to come back until you sort of get to the IVC uh, junction. And then you begin your ablation line and you begin it posterior and you extend it anterior and you cover this entire region here. I used to start on the other side, the systemic venous side, because it was just easier. I never saw a uh, termination. Now that I start here in the pulmonary venous side, I've seen terminations every time. And if I talk to the surgeons, they say, yeah, there's really not much isthmus in this baffle here. This is sort of, you know, back of the heart, left atrial kind of stuff. Almost all of the anatomic peritricuspid isthmus is on the arterial side. Now, there are times where you can't manipulate the catheter. There is a way to puncture the baffle. We usually aim to go here. So the first thing to do is take that angiogram. A lot of times you'll find that there's a spontaneous baffle leak, and you can slide that catheter forward. Uh, so Fontan, uh, this is for people that have um, total right heart bypass. It has three iterations, the old atriopulmonary, the lateral tunnel, and now the extracardiac. In the old style Fontans, you had a lot of atrium that was accessible. In the lateral tunnel, the lateral wall was accessible. And in the new extracardiacs, there's no atrial tissue to touch. So be careful if you try and implant in these people. Uh, you can see that these people generally have figure of eight scar-related circuits. And you'll see these kind of electrograms, complex, fractionated, long-duration electrograms that are part of this microchannel reentry. Let's see. There we go. And these right atria can be enormous. They can be as large as the rest of the heart put together. Reasons for ablation failure, obviously inadequate energy delivery. This is better with our irrigated systems, but you'll also see that even, this is a, a sample that I obtained in a patient after uh, he underwent cardiac transplant, that there are areas of transmural necrosis, there's areas of thrombosis, and there are living myocytes still here. So even with technically good high power lesions, this atrium can be a centimeter thick, and uh, transmural lesions uh, are not always possible. So in terms of where you go, where do you look, okay, in the conventional, septated heart, it's all the isthmus. Flutters live on the isthmus. In the Fontans, they all tend to be lateral wall, microchannel reentry, figure of eight, scar related. Mustard settings, all on the isthmus, but the isthmus is on the other side of a piece of Dacron. Uh, this was our experience um, when I was in uh, Washington University at St. Louis, where I knew Rhea. Uh, we presented this at the um, adult congenital meeting in 2009. Um, you can see that the vast majority of the uh, Mustard setting and the conventionals were on the isthmus. The majority of the Fontans were not. This is a scoring system that looks at arrhythmia burden. Uh, and you can see that arrhythmia burden is relieved by ablation in the conventional and, uh, and the mustard settings. But the Fontans, we do achieve a reduction, but not elimination in arrhythmia burden. So again, it's, uh, hope it's like atrial fibrillation. We're hoping for long honeymoons. So risk stratification in the absence of data, just a little bit to finish up on ventricular arrhythmias. This is Sean White, midline sternotomy. He's the winner of the 2010 gold medal for uh, half pipe. Uh, he has a lot of PVCs on his halter. Somebody said, do you need a defibrillator? It's like, come on, this guy's an Olympian, really? <laughs> He's probably the only guy in the room that's like class zero heart failure. So what can we do? Um, you can extrapolate from the adult guidelines, not that they're valid, but it just gives you a way to uh, work things through. So the secondary prevention is the no-brainer. You know, on a cardiac arrest, you get defibrillator. Um, patients with a structurally abnormal heart and sustained VT, okay, that's sort of the no-brainer. Syncope and the structurally abnormal heart, inducible arrhythmia, sort of, you know, takes you down that must paradigm. And uh, people who have just really low EF, regardless of their etiology. Um, the congenital heart patient is somewhere between ischemic and non-ischemic. They do have some scar substrates, but they don't have macroscopic coronary artery disease. There are some uh, recommendations in specific to congenital patients, and they are secondary prevention. And those who have undergone hemodynamic electrophysiologic evaluation, 
So how do you decide? Okay, so if you look at um, the most typical patient uh, that we see with ventricular arrhythmias is tetralogy of flow. The reason why is their repair. So they have a transannular RVF flow tract patch, they have a VSD patch. There are isthmuses everywhere. You can go around the tricuspid valve, or the, the, the VSD patch, you can go around the uh, RV outflow tract patch. And if you look at the histology of this area, we draw the cartoons like this surgically, but that looks exactly like the peri-infarct zone of an MI. There are viable cells and there are scar cells. So what are the risk factors um, that we've come up with? Um, basically, uh, the prior probability is pretty low. So if you look at sustained arrhythmias, it's only 6% over 10 years. So that's less than 1% per year. That's about what you'd expect for somebody with coronary disease, MI, and preserved EF, risk of about 1% per year. So multiple factors have been proposed, uh, including heart failure. So if you've got blocks, arrhythmias, lots of hypertrophy, nasty halter, positive signal average, all of these things are bad for you, but none of them is the smoking gun. None of these people, like we saw for EF, is an absolute indicator of somebody's risk. So what do we do is we look for um, risk factors that have high positive predictive value, prior palliative shunt, late age at repair, wide QRS, heart failure, all of those kind of things. And you can see that if you have multiple risk factors, your uh, risk of having a clinically significant event over a five-year period is about 50%. If you have none of these, you're pretty good. This is how you decide to take somebody for a risk stratification. Okay, if you have all these non-invasive markers, does um, program stimulation really help us? And uh, I was very happy when this paper came out by uh, Paul Carey. The unselected population falls right about here. So there's about a 20% interest, interest incidence of sudden death or sustained ventricular arrhythmia over about a 20-year period. So about 1% per year. If you're V-STEM negative, that takes that risk down to about 10%. If you're V-STEM positive, that risk goes up to you know, 80%. So the ventricular stimulation study in patients with tetralogy flow has high discriminatory value. The question is, is who do you take to this? And we use the non-invasive risk strat uh, factors on the previous slide. So in conclusion, uh, there are more adults in the United States with children, and the number is growing. There are way more of you guys than there are of us. There are adult congenital patients in your practice and in your community, whether you recognize, accept it, or want it or not. Their most common venue of representation is the emergency department. Their most common symptom is arrhythmia. Flutter is very common in all types of adult congenital disease, and it can be addressed with um, good results, uh, but you need to know the patient's anatomy. You need to know what surgical procedures they had, whether you can get to the usual target, the uh, isthmus, or whether it's on the back of some uh, baffle. Sudden death does occur, and we can extrapolate from the adult guidelines. We can call this non-ischemic cardiomyopathy in those with heart failure. But in the absence of advanced heart failure, and in the absence of low EF, and in the absence of a sustained arrhythmia or a proven sudden death event, you use the non-invasive risk stratification factors, and then you take them to the lab, and you do inducibility. It's not great. It is cumbersome. It is invasive. But it, as you can see, it does have fairly high uh, positive and negative predictive value. So this is uh, the uh, website for the Adult Congenital Heart Association. Uh, they have a directory of uh, centers and providers. So you should always have this uh, on your Rolodex as well. Thanks.